if you look at the photo, you can see James gloat there. He has, uh, he does have a gun, uh, but his traditional costume is really, uh, it's a wonderful image of, of that costume. Um, so going forward, a little bit about who was James Glode. So James Glode was a well-known hunter and guide in 19th century Nova Scotia. This photograph of him appeared in the Dominion Illustrated on April 26, 1890. Since Glode was born or baptized on July 25th, 1831, he would have been about 59 years old when the photo was taken. Moving forward, uh, we, we discover the importance of the oral tradition here. Uh, in his old age, uh, James Glode lived for a while with former Chief Isaac Sack at Shubenacadie, uh, Nova Scotia, and often told stories of his exploits to Sack's grandchildren, Max and Isaac Basque. Again, going forward, Ruth Holmes Whitehead documents the story. Years later, the brothers told Ruth Whitehead of Jim Glode's dramatic meeting with Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse in 1876, when Jim was about 45 years old. Here's the background in the United States. Authority over Indian affairs was divided between the US Departments of War and the Interior, and both departments vacillated, the one failing to live up to treaty obligation uh, treaty obligations, the other failing to protect the indigenous people on reservations from the aggressions of white settlers. The climax came when white gold seeker, seekers overran the Sioux reservation in the Black Hills and the US Army failed to protect the Sioux living on re reservation. Under the command of Chief Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, the off-reservation Sioux went to war against the US Army. On June 25th and 26th, 1876, they ambushed General George Armstrong Custer at Little Bighorn River and annihilated his command of 264 men. So that's the background to the story. So here is where the story of Jim Glode begins. Jim Glode went out west to hunt buffalo with Colonel Charles Alexander, the son of the Earl of Caledon. They were out on the plains for days they hadn't seen any buffalo. One day, the scouts came in and said that they was pr pressing their ears to the ground. They could hear hooves, but they weren't sure whether these hooves was buffalo or horses. After a while, they could tell that these was horses and that they weren't shod. There were many of them coming fast. Now, this was around the time when the Plains Indians weren't getting on so well with the U.S. Cavalry. So Colonel Alexander told Jim Glode to get out the British ensign and fly it so they would not be taken for Americans. About half an hour later, over a little rise comes Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse and about a thousand Sioux warriors, a whole lot of them Sioux. They circled around Jim's little group and stopped. Colonel Alexander, Jim Glode, and the Sioux interpreter rode out to meet them, and Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse and their interpreter came up too. This photo uh, is attributed or, or is, is uh, said to be a, a photo of Crazy Horse, uh, probably the only, uh, only photo that is attributed to, to him. Um, but it is unverified. It is thought to have been Crazy Horse. Crazy Horse earned his reputation among the Lakota, not only by his skill and daring in battle, but also by his fierce determination to preserve his people's traditional way of life. He fought to prevent American encroachment on Lakota lands following the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868, helping to attack a surveying party sent into the Black Hills by General George Armstrong Custer in 1873. Here we have uh, one of many photos of Chief Sitting Bull. Sitting Bull led the Dakota Sioux resistance against U.S. incursion into traditional territory. In 1866, he became principal chief of the Northern Hunting Sioux with Crazy Horse, 
leader of the Ogala Sioux as his vice chief. Respected for his courage and wisdom, Sitting Bull was made principal chief of the entire Sioux Nation in 1867. So when they met, Jim's glowed. This is the quote from Crazy Horse. He said, we haven't eaten for four days, this crazy horse, and we can't afford to kill any more horses. So we must take some of your supplies and some of your horses, but we will only take half. So they thanked them. Sitting Bull did it, and each of them rode away fast from the other side. A few weeks later, still hunting buffalo, Colonel Alexander and his group came on a bunch of cavalry soldiers cleaning their guns and things after a famous victory. The Englishman got invited into the tent to take a drink with the American colonel. After they was riding away, he said to Jim, Jim, you notice anything funny about them men? Yes, said Jim. None of them were wounded. Let's back trail and look at the site of this, where the battle was. So for four days they was riding until they came to a burnt camp, ruined camp. Dead in the grass was where they found them. All the old men, all the women and their children, see? Because all the young men were out with Crazy Horse. He, Jim glowed, he'd always begin to cry when he was telling us how he turned over this young woman and about finding a dead baby in her arms, a sword going in from behind had killed both of them. The mother was running away from the soldiers. They buried them. And that night, I think it was, the Sioux interpreter told them that he can't stay any longer. He had to go to Crazy Horse. So they told them they would head for Canada and would look after his family. This would be Jim Glode, uh, and, and his English, uh, the Englishman. A long time later in Canada, this Sioux came into their camp one night and sat by the fire with Jim Glode. And after a long time of sitting in silence, he begun, he begun to tell Jim about the battle of Little Bighorn. And I might add that this is um, a rare description of the battle from an indigenous perspective. As retold to by Jim Glode, uh, from the interpreter. We went down into this big valley, a big valley. Sitting Bull had all the horses taken away and hidden in the trees up away behind us. He sent some young men with them and told them to stay there until they heard a signal from him. He sent some more young men, about 50 on horseback to lure the army into his trap. He told them, don't get too close and don't get too far ahead of them. Just let them see you and turn around and run. Don't waste your ammunition on them. Here we have an image of uh, George Armstrong Custer, the leader of the U.S. Cavalry at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Then Crazy Horse hit us all in the sagebrush. He said, wait, wait. When they come in, don't shoot the men. Shoot the horses. And then we shoot the men. This is an image of uh, one of the scenes from the, the Battle of Greasy Grass or the Battle of Little Bighorn as uh, created by Amos Badhart Bull. And an interesting uh, portfolio of these drawings or these paintings was discovered and contains some remarkable illustrations. After a while, we could hear the young men riding back down into the valley. Only about 10 of them made it back and we were spread out almost in a ring. When the cavalry came down in after them, we closed that ring. We began to kill the horses, and then we killed them all. This is a famous painting of the Custer fight by Charles Mary and Russell. And another of the images by uh, Amos Badhart Bull. Now, following the Lakota victory at the Battle of Little Bighorn, the Sioux were scattered. Sitting Bull and Chief Gall retreated to Canada for a time. Crazy Horse remained to battle General Nelson Miles as he pursued the Lakota and their allies relentlessly throughout the winter of 1876-77.
In September 1877, when Crazy Horse left the reservation without authorization to take his sick wife to her parents, General George Crook ordered him arrested. Crazy Horse did not re resist arrest at first, but when he realized that he was being led to a guardhouse, he began to struggle. While his arms were held by one of the arresting officers, a soldier ran him through with a bayonet. This was the end of Crazy Horse. Now, following Sitting Bull's move to Canada, government would not acknowledge responsibility for feeding a people whose reservation was south of the border. After four years, during which time his following dwindled and famine uh, set in, Sitting Bull was forced to surrender. After 1883, he lived at the Standing Rock Agency, where he vainly opposed the sale of tribal lands. In 1885, partly to get rid of him, the Indian agent allowed him to join Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, in which he gained international fame. Another thing was happening at the, in the late 1880s, and that was the spread of the ghost dance religious movement, which prophesied the advent of an Indian messiah. The ghost dance movement added to unrest among the Sioux caused by hunger and disease. As a precaution, Indian police and soldiers were sent to arrest the chief. Seized on Grand River in December, on December 15, 1890, Sitting Bull was killed while his warriors were trying to rescue him. So the account that, that James Glode shared with uh, the Sack brothers uh, is a testimony or is a, again, one of those rare indigenous descriptions of one of these famous battles. Here we have a photo of James Glow taken in 1932. This photograph appeared on July 7th, 27th, 1932 in the Halifax Herald with the caption, well-known hunter and guide, James Glode, who celebrated his 101st birthday on Monday at the Mi'kmaq Reservation, Shubenacadie. He was twice married and had 26 children. He is in good health and has never used tobacco. By the end of 1932, Chief William Paul of the Shubenacadie Reservation had told photographer Dr. Clara Dennis that Jim Glode is fairly well to his body, but he is blind and hard to hear. Perhaps Jim's blindness or advanced age helped him to withdraw into a more intimate or private state of mind. Max Bask later remembered that while blind, Jim Glode was living with his son and he used to kneel on his cot, kneel on it for hours, paddling and paddling. In his mind, he was somewhere in a canoe and then he'd get up and drag his cot across the room, get on again, and paddle, paddle. He thought he was portaging the canoe. You see? 60 years after having encountered Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull on North America's Great Plains, Jim Glow died on February 29, 1936, in his 105th year. So thanks to a number of people for the opportunity to share this information. First of all, to Max and Isaac Bask for sharing this remarkable story, to Ruth Holmes Whitehead for documenting this important chapter in the life of one of our native Mi'kmaq guides, and uh, for us, especially to the late Bill Day, for researching and sharing this story with us. Uh, this, I believe, was Bill Day's final essay um, that he shared with us at the uh, Yarmouth County Historical Society, and it didn't make it during his time with us into a program. So I'm honored to be able to use his, his uh, pictorial essay as the background for a program on a remarkable person and a remarkable story. Interestingly enough, we got a note from uh, Barbara McNutt when uh, I when we circulated the topic for tonight's tonight's program, and she said uh, that CBC, the um, unreserved program that is featured on CBC, uh, recently did a program uh, on on another rare Indigenous perspective on the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Um, it was discovered in a letter in the Peel Art Gallery and Museum, and it was a written account 
of the battle uh, as dictated by Chief Standing Bear and recorded by his wife, whose first language was German. And so the, the story was recorded in German. So there would be one other uh, of these records of, of uh, a story or a, an indigenous perspective on the Battle of the Little Bighorn. So that's our story for this evening. So thanks to all for joining us.